Let us talk about bug bounty Botox versus natural beauty. I have a lot of slides and I'm gonna go quickly through some of them, but I'm gonna tell you up front that all of the studies and all the data that I reference in this talk, I have a reference slide at the end, don't panic, and I will make the slides available at the end so you don't, I mean, you can photograph them all, but you don't have to. Okay, so who am I? Um, you know, I got a great introduction there. Uh, this is a Twitter word cloud of the things I find very important to tweet about. <laughs> Um, by the way, after the luau, if anyone wants to do karaoke, I am down. We did some impromptu karaokeing by one of those fire pits last night. I didn't tell anybody about that until now, um, but it happened. But yes, if you're curious about my last name, it is Greek. I am half native Pacific Islander, and actually I named my company Luta Security. That's with a hard T, um, and that is a, a nickname for the island 40 nautical miles north of Guam, where my mother was born. On the map, the island is called Rota, but the islanders call it Luta, the friendliest island. You wave to people as you drive by, and most of the island is my family. So anyway, <laughs> here you say aloha in, uh, in Chamorro, which is the language and the ethnicity of my people on my mom's side, you say hafa day. So can you say hafa day for me? Half a day, pretty good, yeah, that's pretty good. That's all I can say in Chamorro except for swears. Okay, so I've done a lot of these things. Um, we're gonna talk about, this is actually how I describe to my family what I do, a picture is worth a thousand words. And since I'm half Greek, when I testified before the Senate last year, um, I had to help them with my last name because it was like the fifth or ninth time they tried to call on me, the senators tried calling on me at the Uber data breach um, you know, hearing about how they misused their bug bounty program and paid out some extortionists $100,000, which was 10, 10 times the bug bounty maximum amount, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the senators were having trouble, so of course I went to my go-to after the fifth or seventh time, Masaurus, like a dinosaur, and I made T-Rex arms for the senators, so that is how <laughs> I taught them how to pronounce my last name, Katie Masaurus Rex. It's super easy now, right? So, okay, I'm realizing that I cast a large shadow. I'm gonna stay here. This is where I will stay. So how did we get here to Bug Bounty Botox land? I mean, I just was introduced as one of the biggest proponents of some of the biggest bug bounties in the world. What wasn't mentioned there is I also um, helped drive the creation of Hack the Pentagon. How many of you have heard the Hack the Pentagon? First bug bounty program of the US government and first bug bounty program of the military, right? Other governments had experimented with bug bounties, but certainly this was the first military-sponsored bug bounty of the largest military the world has ever known. But we're here because the last 20 years, I have been professionally in the security industry, and uh, I've noticed that we're pretty good at selling stuff. Really good, it's a multi-billion dollar, $170 billion industry by 2020. But wait a minute, <laughs> everything's still broken. And some of the fundamental things, like you know, it used to be try to get the vendor to pay attention to you so that they would create a patch at all. But even when you have a patch, applying the patch is still very inconsistent. So it's like that relay race of you know, security response, where you might hear about a vulnerability or a potential vulnerability, you go through and you investigate, you determine whether or not it's a vulnerability, whether it's exploitable, how severe it is, and then you issue a fix or a mitigation or some combination of both. But then it's that last mile, or in Europe, last kilometer of trying to get them to apply that patch, right? And still, everything's broken. Multi-billion dollar industry, really good at selling stuff, still broken. Because we keep trying to sell these silver bullets. Um, are there werewolves on Hawaii? I don't know. Because there aren't any in, in the rest of the world that I have observed. So I don't think these silver bullets work very well because it's not actually solving anybody's problem. Guess why? One, there are no werewolves, but two, everybody's a little bit different. So let's go ahead and go through some definitions here. I talk about vulnerability disclosure. Some people use that term interchangeably with bug bounties. They are not the same thing. Um, and some people use the terms penetration testing and bug bounties somewhat interchangeably, but also trying to say there's some greater value proposition of one versus the other. So what is vuln disclosure? It is really the process by which anyone outside your organization 
tells you about a potential vulnerability, and you do some investigation, and you come to some conclusion, and then ideally you release some, something about it, an advisory, a patch, mitigation. They're governed by the following two standards. Jorge, who's still in here, is a co-editor of these two standards, along with Art Mannion from CERT-CC, um, the oldest running uh, computer emergency response team in the world. And uh, I, am an, I am also an editor and author of these standards. So ISO 29147 is the vuln disclosure part. It's the process of receiving. And then ISO 3011, 30111 is the process internal to every organization that makes that determination of, you know, let's do an investigation, let's do an in, internal triage, and, um, you know, deciding the priority of the fixes. Maybe you've got 20 critical vulnerabilities. What's the priority of fixing those 20 criticals, right? So it's all that internal process and the creation of the patches and the mitigations. And then the process basically goes back out to the other standard, ISO 29147, for the release portion. So if you want to think about it in graphics, graphic terms, um, ISO 29147 is the mouth and the other end, and ISO 30111 is the digestive system of vulnerability management. Um, penetration testing originated about 20 years ago. Does anyone here remember a company called At Stake? Yes, I am not the oldest person in the room. Awesome. Um, so I grew up in Boston around the guys who were in the loft. Those guys eventually formed a consultancy early on in 1999 called At Stake. This was one of the first application penetration testing companies. And the kinds of arguments that we would get from organizations were things like, wait, you're a bunch of hackers and we're supposed to pay you to point out our bugs? What if you just hold on to those bugs? How can we trust you? Will you find all the bugs? How, how can we guarantee the code coverage and all that stuff? And so we had to actually work not just as pen testers but as educators of an entire industry that no, we weren't gonna find every single bug. We were gonna give you demonstrable ideas about how secure you were overall. We were gonna tell you what vulnerabilities we found, where we found them, how to fix them, and ideas for remediation, and also, At Stake was unique, then and now, in that um, we were pen testers who wanted you to never make those same mistakes again, so we offered to teach you how to fish. We left behind our tools, we gave training, and we did all of this stuff to basically try and improve the security ecosystem, and we were so hopeful. <laughs> so, I'm gonna say we were young, but no, we, we really were full of hope. So, the, the characteristics of a penetration test is that consultants themselves are vetted for skill, they're already background checked, you know, in terms of employment and whatnot, um, usually having clean backgrounds. Most, uh, most pen test companies don't hire convicted felons of hacking, some do, but most don't. And so you have this assurance sort of built in to penetration testing. There were contracts, there were NDAs, and also, from a vulnerability investigation flow perspective, you could control the volume you know, of your cases. You also could get a giant report full of hundreds of bugs and decide the pace at which you would prioritize and fix those issues, because they're not gonna be disclosed, they're under NDA. And then here's the different thing. Different but same, same but different, different, very different, bug bounties. Um, bug bounties did not originate when I launched the Microsoft ones, nor did they originate when Google launched theirs in 2010. They actually originated back in 1995. Anybody remember? Say it, yell it. Netscape, that's right, 1995. So it didn't really catch on in the mainstream until Google launched their bug bounty in early 2010. Anybody remember how much? That's right, $1,337, leet dollars for a bug bounty. And how they've evolved since 2010 to now and where the shortfalls are in the current market is what we're gonna talk about. All right, so a lot of people say that, you know, this should be easy, everyone should be doing this, at least do a vuln disclosure program, even if you're not gonna pay bug bounties. What are you afraid of? Just open the front door, see what happens. Otherwise, you know, the argument is the bad guys are testing you anyway and you're just not getting the report. That's a famous quote. Um, about, about doing vuln disclosure and bug bounties. But what could possibly go wrong? Well, most people are expecting just white hat, maybe a couple gray hats, maybe a little bit of a flood, but not too bad. You know, but it's usually something a little closer to this. And um, there are a few different areas to, to kind of unpack here, right? 
how do you distinguish friend from foe? How do you distribute your incident response resources when you're trying to determine is this a real attack? Or is this someone just testing and they're about to tell me what it is that they're doing? What about data privacy, right? There are protected classes of data, healthcare data, PII of various kinds, that have regulatory breach reporting requirements associated with them, right? Remember the Uber data breach that happened, um, you know, it, it's, it was basically where these hackers had found some creds and then they tried to report it in exchange for money. They actually didn't know about the bug bounty program. They were redirected there, um, which was good. That's the appropriate thing to do. And then um, what had happened was basically to prove the severity of what they had found, they ended up downloading 57 million records. That's like a little, just a proof of concept, <laughs> right? But the thing was, you know, with that, with that having happened, what, what Uber did really well during that hearing was they took full responsibility for making the wrong call on that one. And I really admire them for doing that because, you know, essentially they just said it was the wrong call. We should have reported it as a breach. Instead, we used our bug bounty platform to effectively, you know, just pay out an extortion fee. They called it that during, during the trial, or during, it wasn't a trial, <laughs> during the hearing. So I think they did a good job of recognizing and correcting. But the damage to the market perception and the ecosystem may have already been done, right? Because if you think about it, we're building a defensive market for bugs, right? Everybody knows there's an offense market for bugs. People call it the black market. It's not really a black market because it's not illegal. But it's the offense market because nation states, cyber criminals, et cetera, are buying vulnerabilities at high prices in order to keep them private for as long as possible, keep them unpatched, and use them against targets. So that's why that's the offense market. But we were trying to grow the defense market. We were trying to make it easier for individuals anywhere in the world to find vulnerabilities, use their skills, and get paid. But so one of the things that happened was they were asked to delete all the data, which they did, and sign an NDA. And these folks aren't lawyers, these, these hackers who had done this. So they thought, great, we got paid 10 times what we would have gotten paid you know, if we had just done the bounty program. And we signed this NDA, and we did what they asked us, so we're safe. Well, it doesn't necessarily protect them from being potentially uh, sued by the victims, right? And in fact, it confused them enough that the same hackers who were involved in that Uber situation were later indicted for trying the exact same trick on a subsidiary of LinkedIn. So they clearly, I don't think, I mean, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like they would have maliciously done it. They were just really confused by the way this, uh, this played out. So, Thinking about data privacy, distinguishing friend from foe, do NDAs protect your organization from further legal action? We saw in the Uber data breach it did not. And do the NDAs protect the hackers? Absolutely not. So what is gonna happen when our machine overlords come and start finding vulnerabilities in more of an automated fashion? Anybody familiar with the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge? Okay, so before that occurred, uh, the DARPA folks had asked me you know, what I thought about whether or not they should do an AI-driven challenge that would find, and, and the quote that made my eyes turn big was, what if we could find 10,000 vulnerabilities via AI? And I said, you will break every security response team on Earth. I will tell you that. Like, you know, essentially, and they said, well, no, no. What if we had it also AI automatically patch everything? And I said, you know, if it were that easy to auto patch, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have had, you know, wanna cry, et cetera. Like, this is, you know, there are app compat issues, backwards compatibility issues, all kinds of things. People still have to test patches in their environments. So they basically made the grand challenge against an artificial target. Because otherwise, you know, it would have been effectively you know, inciting a, a riot of bugs that no security organization on Earth today, including the biggest one that I have ever heard about, Microsoft, to be able to digest those. I remember once we got 700 crash dumps from a researcher at CERT-CC. And just the mechanics of trying to decide, okay, do we open one case and then have a bunch of child cases? But what if some of these crashes are, you know, root cause is different? Okay, then we were gonna have to move these cases and make distinct, I mean, it was a nightmare of logistics, right? So that was just 700 from one friendly, from one friendly researcher. 
Okay, so this is a true story. Um, I gave a keynote at RBA Sec. Jake is the speaker right after me. And uh, in Richmond, two days before my keynote, this happened. So this guy had some mental illness. Luckily, he wasn't hurt and nobody else was hurt in this incident. Um, and mental illness is a really serious issue. But we can kind of take a look at this. He was tweeting from this uh, armored vehicle that he had stolen from a base. And he drove it around Richmond and was eventually apprehended. OK, I don't know if we've got sound on this, but let's give it a go. If not, I'll do, oh, yeah, there we go. So this went on for hours. This is actually the end of the chase. Through two days before my keynote. And as you can see, bypassers, OK, there's swear words, people. Cover your ears if you're just delicate. But these people are watching this armored vehicle. Now, this thing's only going about 40 miles an hour. That's like top speed. OK? But <laughs> yeah. So luckily, it didn't have any weapons. This was one of the unarmed vehicles. No crashes, no injuries. But look at how many real incident response resources were tied up in the investigation. Eventually, he was tased and everything, and nobody was hurt. But he claimed that he had authorization and he was performing a test. He had actually done some infosec stuff as well. So a lot of the fears of organizations when they open up their front door to vulnerability disclosure is if they've accidentally authorized something that would tie up their real resources, or that in fact, even if they didn't authorize it explicitly, that someone would claim that they thought they had authorization. So don't the bug bounty platforms take care of this for you? Right? They're going to manage this flood. They're going to deduplicate the issues. Only cherry-picked real vulnerabilities are going to come through. But isn't that relying on a source of labor that is, in fact, finite? Right? So when I used to work at Microsoft, I was there from 2007 to 2014. 2007, Popular Science called a Microsoft security grunt among the top 10 worst jobs in science. We were somewhere between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. We were, we're in there, and we made t-shirts. Oh, yes, we did. So here's the thing. That role is full-time, regular employee, non-contract, six-figure paying, benefits, all of that stuff. We couldn't keep people in that role for more than 12 to 18 months. There was the highest turnover rate. Why? Because it's exhausting. And if you're actually really good at it, you want to end up doing something else, right? So let's take a look at the scale. 150,000 to 200,000 non-spam email messages a year going into Secure App Microsoft. Now, there was a recent, um, I saw a recent MSRC presentation, um, I think it was last spring, so fairly recent, where they actually said that number is the same. Now, this is five years post bug bounty. And I'll say why that might be the case. Because, you know, for the biggest software company in the world, we sure got a lot of love for free. So one of the executives of Microsoft had sworn publicly, said, we will never pay for vulnerability information. Why? Because they were already getting flooded out, OK? Whale feces researcher, all these, you know, elephant vasectomists. Anyway, so even if you can filter every bad stuff out, there's such a thing as too much chocolate, too much of a good thing, right? So eventually, if your process, your digestive system for these bugs is ill-equipped, you'll end up having a huge backlog you don't know what to do with. And if you're failing at prioritization, well, that backlog just gets worse, and eventually someone's going to catch you with bugs melted all over you. Anyway, so um, I do have an entire presentation about this uh, from this maturity model for vulnerability coordination. Um, which I had created. And it's more than just engineering. It's more than just having people who can examine the bugs. So if you want this presentation, there's a reference to it at the very end of the slides. And I had given this, uh, this one at RSA. I forgot what year, because it's been a long career. Anyway, um, the idea here is that organizations should benchmark their capabilities in not just engineering, but communications, the organizational support it takes to run and fund these programs sustainably, um, doing analytics such that you're not just playing whack-a-bug, but you're actually seeking to get better and looking to measure how well are you, how well are you doing, and then looking at incentives. 
It's not just all about cash, though. So this is from a different presentation where I had done some research with MIT Sloan School and Harvard Kennedy School on the vulnerability economy and exploit market. And what we found useful was to use a vulnerability taxonomy. Not all bugs are created equal. There are some that are easy to find, easy to fix. Some are easy to find, hard to fix. The exploitability of bugs is different. And also the market dynamics. You know, some people will swear to you that if you don't pay a bug bounty, then the black market is going to pay for them. Now, I highly doubt that there is an offense market for every bug. How many of you believe there's an offense market for every bug? Exactly, thank you. You are all either not listening or very honest. Um, so there's also human dynamics, right? We need to know why it is that people are focusing in on certain bugs. And this changes the dynamics and the priorities of any individual bug. So this will come up a little bit later. A lot of organizations say, you know, I really want to start a bug bounty program because I'm really interested in ants. But actually, they start one and all they get are bees. OK, there's a deliberate type mismatch in the bugs that are described here. Often, that, again, ties up their resources that they wanted to spend looking for interesting bugs. So for example, you know, Microsoft would get bug reports for all versions of IE, all the way down. You know? um, and as long as the, that version was still supported, Microsoft still had to service it, but it wasn't actually telling Microsoft a whole lot about its new security engineering processes, its best efforts. right? So you want to hear about bugs in your latest but maybe you want to hear about bugs in your most widely deployed, which might not be your latest. So there's a whole bunch of things that an organization can want to hone in on, but if they haphazardly throw the doors open and kind of say, just report these bugs in the various, they might end up with something they didn't really want to spend a lot of cycles on. So what does it get you? Paying for bugs versus actually becoming more secure. Um, right now, the majority of bug bounty bugs are cross-site scripting. I believe there was a Google presentation earlier today, and that was also the case with, uh, with some of their bug data. But certainly on the bug bounty platforms, they release reports, and the majority are cross-site scripting. Now, there are tools that are available to find lots of cross-site scripting bugs. Not all of them, but certainly lots of them. So why are organizations choosing to outsource and replace much of their own security due diligence with this? Well, maybe because they've been told that it's more cost effective than traditional penetration testing. But remember, we can't wait until after code is released and after services are online to test for security bugs. We, as at stakers, tried to tell people this. You can't pen test your way to security, and you certainly can't bug bounty your way to security. That is what I call bug bounty Botox. You're basically trying to do a veneer of looking like you care about security, but are you getting better? Are you making sound security investments? And are you actually moving it so that you are becoming due diligent, or doing your due diligence, as opposed to just looking like you're busy? So what are some of these myths, motivations in this marketplace? Um, the myth that bug bounties are the logical end goal of all vuln disclosure programs that you're not really fully mature until you have a bug bounty program. Well, how many of you think that it's a good idea to have a bug bounty program on industrial control systems that can take down the power grid? OK, all right, wait, his hand went up, but his thumb went down. OK, I just, don't do this to me. I had a heart attack, maybe. It was like, oh, OK. Um, but here's the thing, you know, it's not necessarily on its own a measure of maturity. Same thing, myth, hackers will only look for bugs in exchange for cash. I'm going to dispel that one with an example in a minute, but it's an overall trend, right? Um, and actually, I think I, I was seeing on Twitter that Charlie Miller and um, Chris Valasek, famous car hackers and everything, who have been working on uh, car security for a long time, well, they don't do car bug bounties. They are highly skilled in a specific area, and they have families. So they like full-time regular employment. Um, and another myth is that you have to outbid the offense or black market. Now, the fact of the matter is with that is that there's a logical ceiling above which you cannot offer defensive prices. Does anyone want to guess why that is? You're not a nation state, but no, it's, well, it's basically, yeah, that's part of it that you you're not going to be able to outbid them, right? They can always go higher. 
I mean, if you think about it, if Apple offered a million dollars for every you know, iOS jailbreak, how many Apple engineers do you think would be working there at the end of the year, right? And even if they all stayed because they enjoy job stability, how many new candidates, junior candidates, would they be able to recruit if one of them could hit a million dollar bounty legit through the defense market? So let's look at a particular case study. This particular guy had made a payday of $119,000, and it was kind of a bundle of, of bug bounties that were all paid out. And I said it was great ROI for him because he had admitted that it was about four hours of work. He did a little recon you know, earlier than the four hours, but it was roughly four hours. So great, you know, great ROI for his time, but kind of terrifying ROI for the company. Like, you know, I mean, the Project Zero folks, correct me if I'm wrong, do not make $29,000 an hour. I mean, maybe we could have kept more of the uh, MSRC security grunts in, in role if they made $29,000 an hour, recruited some whale feces researchers to help out. I don't know. <laughs> but here's the thing. I mean, you can read through this, this dialogue and everything, but you know, somebody came in and said, why would he accept a full-time regular position inside an organization if he could get so much more money with bug bounties. And I'm like, I'm not saying you would. Another top researcher did. And then the researcher himself chimes back in. He's like, actually, I was trying to join them full time. I would prefer that. And then you know, the guy who had questioned why comes, you know, comes in and says, look, I'm not trying to poke into your business, but, but why would you do that? Why would you take so much less? And here it is, because I have a daughter. I want to make sure that my income is stable and she doesn't have to worry about it. So even though he's capable of reaping the benefits of, this, the, of the highest end of the gig economy, he wanted the stability. He prefers that. And he's been trying for it for a while. OK, so back again to the labor market and the system dynamics. Um, how many of you are familiar with a little bit of light system dynamics? Well, anyway, there's complex systems. There are, think of it like multiple levers that can affect, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> multiple levers that can affect uh, any given system. We were trying to study, is price the most effective lever? Could we outbid the offense market? Is that effective? Will that move the needle and the balance toward defense? The answer is no, least effective, hardly made a blip. Because again, the offense market can keep piling on money, and then eventually the defense market would be paying bug hunters more than the CEO, which might be cool, <laughs> but also not sustainable. So um, you know, that, that whole thing was presented at RSA, and there's a reference to it later. Um, but there's more to this system than money. So what does this market look like? Um, one of the labor market papers in which we studied the bug bounty labor market of Facebook's bug bounty program and Hacker One's at the time, um, and the data was between 2013 and 2015 timeframe, that paper had been published as a chapter in an MIT press book on the economics of bug bounties. And it got some recent attention because a company called Trail of Bits did a blog post about it. And I think, you know, Hacker One's reaction was, that's not our data, or if it is, it's old. And then they had a friend publish this article. So this is, these are current HackerOne numbers. Over 300,000 hackers, about one in 10 have found something at all. OK, that's less. <laughs> um, of those who have filed, maybe a quarter have received a bounty. A 1,000 of them have earned 5,000 or more. A 100 of them have earned 100,000 or more. And only two of them are at or approaching a million dollars. OK, so that actually, this is very simple math. You're looking at 0.03% of this population. Now, they're independent contractors. Therefore, they're on all the bug bounty platforms. They're not really tied to one or the other. So you're sharing probably somewhere between 100 and 1,000 sets of eyeballs. So this myth that bug bounties are superior to pen tests because they provide continuous coverage of friendly hackers well, the numbers really don't lie. And actually, the proportion of skilled labor is smaller now than it was when we did the original study, because there were fewer than 10,000 hackers signed up on Hacker One when we did the original study. So what were we hoping for? Remember, we were hoping to create the defense market for bugs, to democratize vulnerability hunting, to make it so that we could identify talent around the world. Anyone know about the mathematician uh, Ramanujan? Natural mathematician had found a calculus book. 
He was poor in rural India, and from that calculus book, he started writing to Oxford and about mathematics. He eventually was brought over. Um, he died a tragic death of like bronchitis or pneumonia or something like that, but he was one of the most prolific mathematicians in modern times, and that's who I wanted to find. Not, not happening, really. So why are we missing you know, this whole funnel of labor? Well, I think it's because these things have been over-marketed, right? And even the bug bounty companies themselves are saying that this business model is not working out for them. In the article in which this quote came from, um, you know, the, the CEO said that bug bounties are only about a $150 million market, whereas pen testing is a billion dollar market. So we're just gonna peel off some of that. Now remember, pen testers are full time, get benefits, are highly skilled and vetted, but the expectation is that, oh no, 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 we're gonna convince them to come over and be in this gig economy. Okay, good luck with that. But here's the thing, the marketing has been working. This is Google's search history from 2004 when they first started to modern times. And bug bounties are now more frequently searched for than penetration testing. That's called some SEO on steroids. So what is the truth? Bug bounties are not a replacement for penetration testing. They can be complementary and they can work out very well. Alone, they don't indicate security maturity if you haven't done your due diligence. And all humans have a mix matrix of, um, of emotions and motivations, and they change over time. I was a professional hacker for seven years. You could not have convinced me to go in-house, and yet I joined Microsoft, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, I joined Microsoft not as a hacker, but as a strategist. So people change in what they want to do and what their attention span is focused on. And that the defense market for bugs can only go so high. It's not infinite, neither is the labor market. So, Perverse incentives, I mentioned Netscape. This is what real Dilbert cartoon uh, artist uh, Scott Adams had written when Netscape announced their bug bounty. One of the stats that is released in uh, some of the bug bounty reports is how much more money you can make as a bug bounty hunter in each individual country compared to the median salary of the developers. So I think it's 16 times median salary in India. Where do we outsource software? A lot. Yeah, so I can see Sister number one, software developer, outsource, you know, outsourcing uh, software development in India. Sister number two, bug bounty hunter. I can see no problems with this, can you? Okay, so this graph on the left is the real graph and the real data that convinced Internet Explorer to pay for its own bugs. What you're seeing there is the white line, low squiggly line, is the number of real bug reports that came in during the IE10 beta period. And then there was a huge spike of submissions. Why? Because before there was money, there was only recognition. If it affected only the beta, the latest product, and they fixed it during beta, you would get no bulletin. So absolutely, we were actually creating our own perverse incentive. And when I looked at the data, I said, we can do traffic shaping. If we put a bug bounty at the beginning of the IE11 beta period, we can offer them recognition, a little bit of cash, and get those bugs as early as possible. So it was win-win all around. We got 18 bulletin class vulnerabilities. Guess how much we paid total? Each of them would have been worth six figures on the offense market. 18, how, how much do you think? You can't answer, Jorge, because you probably know. 35. 35? Anyone higher, lower? It's like the price is right. <laughs> I don't know what you win, but. Total. 65. All right, 35, 65, going once, one, two, 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 two. anybody else? 100? Hundred, wait, what? Is it right there? No, that was a different bug bounty. That was to one guy. No, I'm talking about the 18 bulletin class issues. No? No? Uh, a little over $28,000 total. Right, so the $100,000, remember I was talking about perverse incentives and you're like, what are you saying, Katie? You just paid $100,000 to one guy. Well, this was for something that was sufficiently rare. It was new exploitation techniques. It wasn't just what you get at Pwn to Own, right? Which at the time was the same price, $100,000. And Pwn to Own only happens once a year. We made this all year round. Now the price of this has gone up, 
but it's still sufficiently rare and within sort of the boundaries such that you're not necessarily going to gut your hiring pipeline or you lose your employees as a result of them wanting to do bounty instead. All right, fast forward to hack the Pentagon, because I know I gotta wrap it up. <laughs> Hack the Pentagon. So take a look at these numbers. What I want you to pay attention to is the total registered. We were hoping for a few hundred. We got 1,400 people to come forward and put their social security numbers in a form and uh, pre-register for this. Now, I loved the paranoia. Some of my hacker friends were saying, oh yeah, like I'm gonna give the government my social security number. I'm like. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you're real smart at finding bugs, friend. But anyway, they already know. And they're like, no, but they're going to have one-way ticket to Gitmo. So it didn't happen that way. Um, <laughs> but look at the signal to noise. It's kind of horrendous. That's a, that's a pretty horrendous signal to noise. Also, never start a bug bounty program at midnight. Ouch. 13 minutes past midnight. Lesson learned. OK, now what happened after that? Hack the Army was the next one we launched. And we also launched the ongoing Vuln disclosure program for the entire DOD, which was actually more important. It was more important to be able to report anything you saw across any DOD website, whether or not there was money involved. So we had worked out that process, made sure people were ready for it, had a procedure to stood up, and we went ahead and launched Hack the Army. Now this was Secretary Fanning, former Secretary of the Army, right after this picture was taken, so that's kind of like a large mock-up of what the, uh, the challenge coin token was going to look like. He said, hey, for the Hack the Pentagon challenge token, you know, you had some binary around there. It said, translated to, I hacked the Pentagon. Could we of ours say, I hacked the army, beat Navy? <laughs> and yeah, we did. And they did, actually. So I, I think it was the hackers. Um, so look at the numbers now. 371 participants. And look at that signal to noise. Oh, also, we started it at like noon. That was better. So signal to noise is better. What lever did we use? We capped the participation at just around like 400 or something. And that's, that's how many people had accepted the invitations. So there are other ways to sort of manipulate this to make it bite-sized, to make it doable. And there are a number of other challenges that are ongoing that happen at the Pentagon. But they're all you know, pretty much these chunked in time, manageable sessions. So how do we hack the labor market itself? One of the things I said to Congress about what they can do to improve the state of security was the fact that you know, Congress authorizes funding of American universities, many of the American universities. And top 10 computer science programs in US universities don't require security to graduate at all. Three of them don't even have the electives if you wanted to take it. So I suggested that they maybe not fund these uh, colleges and universities unless they pledge to add computer security. Right? But <laughs> in the end, bug bounties are good for a few things. You can identify unique talent that you might not have seen. Ramanujan might be out there for you. But it's terrible for employee morale if you haven't thought through your incentives, and terrible for data privacy and security if you haven't thought through what can happen on purpose or even as a haxident. You know, who is the speaker with the apostrophe in his name? Is he still here? Yes, I used to live on O'Farrell Street. Accidents happen all the time. So you need to know what your playbook is there. What should you do? Hack yourself, then hack your labor. Figure out where the balance actually needs to be shifted. Where do you actually need to prioritize investments for security? Because you are not going to get there with bug bounty and pen testing alone. And beware of perverse incentives. If people are telling you just to go ahead and start and to jack up the prices, guess what you're doing? you got a little Botox going on. It's not going to help you with what you really need to do. You need to work on your inner beauty, your inner processes. So here are the, the principles that we need to live by. We've romanticized offense for too long and the labor market for offense. You know, there are many cultures that have this idea of balance between creation, maintenance, and destruction. This is just one of them. We need to bring balance to the security force. Here are the references. And because we're in Hawaii, I'll leave you with one last thought and an impersonation. Does anyone remember the movie Lilo and Stitch from Hawaii? It was a Disney movie before they had Moana. I'm Katie Moana, by the way. Anyway, um, but you know, these people come from different industry backgrounds and came into security. That's a nurse up there who is now one of the leading proponents of medical device and healthcare cybersecurity. This woman here, this is her daughter 
doing some lock picking and soldering. When she was pregnant with this girl, she lived in a homeless shelter. We need to look at our labor market holistically because ohana means family, and family means nobody is left behind or forgotten. Thank you. questions for Katie and they were, oh my God, you're awesome. Oh my God, that was awesome. Katie, we love you. You're awesome, Katie. And the other one was, oh my God, you're awesome. If you have, oh, sorry, sorry. If you have any other questions for Katie, she's going to be right in the back. Please ask her. Please, just, she's very, and, and I'll be at the luau. She's very approachable. She'll be at the luau. She has a lot to say on Bug Bounties. Give her a warm applause for Katie, please. <laughs>